Hey, Rob, thanks, dude. Thanks for coming on. I still remember you as this, uh, what I would consider like a young athlete when I used to come train with the cyclists. <laughs> and uh, usually I'd drop these guys and make them feel bad. And no, that wasn't the case. <laughs> Uh, but Rob and I go way back, um, really till, I mean, you were probably early twenties when I first met you, maybe even, I don't think you're late teens, but you were, you were a young, young dude up and coming. And, um, I think the thing I appreciate most about Rob is that I don't feel like in the early days you were like this prodigy that was really gonna, hmm. you, you know, I, I, you were sort of, I don't want to say average, but you were just kind of, you weren't like, I was, I was way below average. Yeah. Like you weren't sort of this guy that was like touted to be the next great Canadian cyclist, but you just stuck with it. It's like, you just sort of, uh, pursued, pursued, pursued. You kept working hard every year. I know there was some years in there that were like really tough where you're like, why am I doing this? I'm probably going to pack it in. And, but you didn't, you just kept sticking with it. And in the last probably five years in particular, I mean, you've really, uh, I would say come into your own and done some pretty amazing things. So, um, I'm just kind of, kind of run through a little spec sheet for you. So first of all, you're from Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, you call out, uh, Calgary home, I think, right. Or Victoria. Uh, Vic no, Victoria home for sure. Vic Victoria home. Like yeah. grew up in Regina, grew up in Regina until I was 20. And then, um, yeah, I've been out here ever since say for the three years when we went to uh calgary for um ricky school so yeah, yeah. victoria is definitely home yeah cool and um anyway so you you've had you know quite a few results in the mid to you know mid 2000 like early 2000s but then really i think in 2015 you won the tour of gila tour of the gila mm -hmm. am i saying that right where is that uh he, uh gila i gila. Uh, say with like an h um yeah. it's in uh silver city new mexico Okay. And that was pretty like that. I think that was a bit of a breakthrough result for you. Hey. Yeah. The year before was probably the bigger breakthrough. Um, I'd come back from North America uh, or sorry, come back from racing uh, in the UK and signed with this sort of unknown team um, in the U S and I got third in, uh, in that, like in Tour of Gila. And that was when, I'd already had like one race in the Dominican Republic that had been a bit of a surprise that year. And then when I was third at Gila, um, kind of first shot after not doing it for a couple of years, that's when like, that was like you go back and you want to win the next year. And we did, which is even more um, special that like we targeted to win it and actually did it. So yeah. Um, yeah. 2014, there's a, like, you, if you look back at the 2014 results, you see a bunch of like these little ones um that really reflect the stepping stone to 2015 where the, the consistency of those results came through yeah wow that's that's like that that's cool it must have felt pretty good because i know the um your time in england which i'd like to get into in a little bit was was a little bit rough and a bit of a weird time for you hang on hang on one sec okay i just uh, i just got a note saying our links for the the zoom chat here is a little bit off. So we're, I'm going to put you on pause just for one sec. Okay, yeah, Rob, sure. yep. make sure we can, uh, uh, I had to, I had to click like there's two, sorry to interrupt, but like I had to click the date okay. and it to this, I clicked, like, if you click on Rob's, there's a like separate thing where you can click on Rob's name and that yes. took me a different one. But if you click on the link on the, that, says the date then it brought me into this meeting so like on rob's name you can still click on there you can click on it but it's not the right it wasn't it wasn't this link oh weird and so how did you get into this link again click on the the date it's a sep like it's oh like it's two separate links ah dear i've totally messed that up anyway well i don't know if there's much i can do about it right now um let's just people... carry on i'll apologize to the masses later <laughs> um anyway so uh carrying on from there uh um so in 2017 you won the tour of utah yeah yeah which i like that's probably i think i feel like that's the one that really like 
solidified that you were were really a contender in these tours like and as a cyclist in Canada and North America really like that was pretty legit yeah that was I mean that was the big like for sure my biggest um stage race win well it's only my big on that and heel are the two stage races of one um but that was definitely the biggest one for sure um but again all these things kind of were like uh successive stepping stones like nothing like if you like backtrack at all there's always like a framework to like what happened prior to leading into it so um you know 2014 we had third at Gila and then the next year we went back and won um that gave me confidence to ride top 10 at California um and the year before um I had tried to do something special at Utah and Colorado we started to realize I was good at altitude um and then so 2014, it was too hard to do the Utah Colorado double. Um, I was just exhausted, but I did, like, I did score a podium um, at the highest stage in Breckenridge in Colorado in 2014. So in 2015, when we went back, um, we targeted only Colorado because it was higher. And I actually went uh, third there behind um, Rowan Dennis, who is one of the best, like he's two-time world time trial champion now. I was second to him in the time trial at Breckenridge and that's what scored me the third overall there. Um, and then the next year we just, I got moved to a different team, figured that out. 2016, I think I went fourth or fifth at Utah overall. Yeah. And that's what, okay, well now next year we got to come back and try to win it. Um, and then they put in uh, a high altitude um, uphill individual time trial. And that was when, like, uh, it was tailor-made kind of for me. And then it had two two more mountaintop finishes on top of that. So, um, yeah, it was that was about as good as it gets for me. Yeah. That's pretty wild, eh? Did you, did you just sort of, like, fluke into realizing that you were good at altitude? Or was that something that testing picked up early on? Because I, I don't imagine you specifically went to altitude to train. It sounds like you just had a like uh i don't want to say a knack for it but maybe we're, we're built for it a certain way um i wouldn't say i knew that it was a talent until i started like it's probably year two on smart stuff so 2015 um when i started feeling like, even before then like i'd always had um even without altitude preparation at my first time at gila i scored second on like the Gila monster stage and that was a year like Lance and um Levi and Tom Danielson all these like big stars were there and I got in the breakaway and we stayed away um and then I ended up getting yeah, second on the like considered like at the time the hardest non like tour of California stage in North America um without any altitude training I trained in California um, which it, it just made it doesn't make any theoretical sense given that I grew up in Saskatchewan and then came from Victoria and was training in California. There's no like, oh, maybe you got a bump from this or maybe you're a bit acclimated from where you came from. There's none of that. So um, that's maybe the first hint, um, but I didn't really think anything of it. But then since then, I mean, I've done like a hell of a lot of training. I trained um, very specifically at altitude for altitude. Uh, before any altitude race, for sure, minimum two weeks, usually three, sometimes four. Um, yeah, I use altitude for sea level races as well. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a pretty crucial part of my training to peak for races, which is something I'm actually killing up this year. But um, I think it's 2015 when I realized that altitude was definitely like some people were gifted at this or that altitude racing is like over 2000 meters is definitely for whatever reason what i'm like naturally good at that's pretty cool dude what's your so when you utilize altitude as part of the lead-in what's your timing coming off of it do you go like right up until race day and then you you go or do you give it because i think there's a, bunch, a couple different theories as to what's most effective what have you found is most effective for you um for me, it's usually about five days to a week out we go. Um, a lot of it's based um, more so just on uh, team travel. So the team will set up to go and we get there about a week before or five days before. 
Um, and a lot of times I'm coming from like, I'm training high, but like staying in Colorado, like in Boulder. So I think it's only, that's only like, I think 5,000 feet or something. Um, so it's not crazy, crazy high. Um, so there's not as big of a change, but if, if I was coming from, sometimes I stay up above Boulder, like at 8,500 feet and then go to Salt Lake, which is I think 3,300 feet. Just talking like American talk right now, but, uh, yeah, like it's, um, it's usually, yeah, I'd never go less than four days because usually about a week out is when I start to like, you start to get that, like almost like Superman feeling like turbo boost for me. Um, so that's when I like, usually the target stages aren't stage one or stage two usually. Um, so yeah, I guess that's a long winded way to say about a week out. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. I, I know back when I was racing, we, there was two strategies. One was that you would, uh, you would go and then you would come right off of it right away and race. And the other was waiting about a week or a little bit, a little bit longer to get, uh, the full effect. Um, yeah, I think that still stands true to today. Like, um, it's like that seven to 10 days up to two weeks is when you like are feeling like maximum benefits. Um, but the benefits also, the realizing benefits last longer than just yeah. like four or five days. Like you're looking at like a couple of weeks worth of like, improved performance yeah yeah cool um i think that's neat i think it's also neat that not only does altitude like your responder to altitude i think they they would call it you were in the responder category or the non-responder category not only do you respond and can kind of come low and race but you it sounds like you actually race really well at altitude as well which not everybody does especially as you said coming from you know uh, Regina, Saskatchewan. It's not a natural part of your physiology, probably. Yeah, yeah no, it's, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Is yeah, you have people who like can get fit to race back down at sea level from racing in altitude. Like, it's usually like a pretty awful experience while they're at altitude. Mm -hmm. Um, but they get quite, they get quite fit. Um, but I, I while well, I do get quite fit, it usually makes me just even that much better to when I race like up high versus just using it as a training stimulus to get better to race down low. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Eh? You discover a little like uh superpower. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really rad actually. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I love it too. It's probably, uh, uh, I mean the, the physiology is one thing, but then it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're like, I'm at altitude. I'm good. I'll yeah. just, I'll just, exactly. I'll just hurt more than anybody or whatever you're, you know, what's going on in your head. I think that's cool. I don't know how we went down that rabbit hole. I, I was still introducing you. It's still part of the introduction of Rob <laughs> <laughs> Um, Anyway, one of the other things I, we don't need to go there, but I just found really interesting is that you're your high school chess champion. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, that is kind of a story that came about in Tour of California. Um, I'm actually not um oh <laughs> we, don't chess, we don't have a chess club but this 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 like somehow is like stuck with like my bio um this is like a mike creed joke and he loves it because it's like it's this story that's stuck without yeah any like real truth to it um <laughs> that's awesome. i was in the break i was in the breakaway at uh the 2015 tour of california and they like didn't know anything about me because the team like hadn't like filled in my bio or something <laughs> So the NBC person contacted our media person who was in the car to, car with Creed and Creed's like a forever, like kind of like Chester. He's always, he's always making a joke of sorts. Um, so he's like, oh, hold on. Okay, write this. And it was basically it's like Rob was the provincial high school national chess champion. It's like the wording didn't even make sense. And his, Ironically enough, we call him the bishop, and but the irony is that his dad and grandfather were both actually bishops in the church, and it was just like this like convoluted, ridiculous story. And oh my gosh, it's stuck. Like, so it's yes, not even. Like, it's not even. Do you even know how to play chess? <laughs> not really. <laughs> yeah. That's so great. I you have me yeah. like hook, line, and sinker. I I read that and I was like, oh, that's a really cool fact about Rob. I like that that's in his bio <laughs> yeah no it's 
it's not true, but yeah, it somehow is stuck. It's too funny. You you hear my my dogs going crazy in the background. If you if you hear some noise, um, so another another really fun thing that I pulled out um, from your Strava feed is that you have ridden, you have logged one hundred and eighty seven thousand two hundred and seventeen kilometers on Strava. Yeah, it's like five times as many kilometers as we put in our car. That is just extraordinary. I. I was blown away by that number in particular. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty no, it's, wild. It's, it's funny because I think we got, our, we got our car at the end of 2014, and I was looking at the uh, odometer the other day, and I think we're at like 89,000K or something like this. Yes. I'm like, I'm like, done more than double that on my bike. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, Do you log everything, like even race segments and – like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just, just it's all my Garmin, so it all just gets uploaded. All, all feeds in there. Yeah, yeah. So, so that kind of pretty accurate, probably ninety eight percent accurate. Yeah, cool. Well, that kind of leads me down the next rabbit hole. I really want to go with you, which I find probably I think is one of the neatest things about you, and why everybody should follow you on Strava and Instagram. <laughs> is because racing aside, you do these unbelievable bike packing adventure trips. Like some of the stuff you do is just so cool. And I, I know personally, and I know a lot of people, we live kind of vicariously through you, especially <laughs> if we have kids and other responsibilities that, you know, not to say that we would go and do that because some of them are incredibly epic. Um, but it just looks like such an amazing life of adventure that you've created like on top of and to complement your racing. So I'd love to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, it is exactly that. It's, um, kind of, I'd say I've always been someone who seeks out like the path less ridden or like the road less traveled, um, both like figuratively, but also, like very literally, um, I'm a guy who will ride his time trial bike down like a gnarly gravel, like single track to see where this goes. Cause it looks like there might be a road over there that could be kind of cool and no one would ever like take their time trial bike, you know, even <laughs> off of the road, let alone like a single track. Um, and then just over the years, that's like, and it's something that even COVID has really like confirmed for me, not that it was like a surprise, but like, I'm, I need to have like adventure in my life and like that sense of like unknown and finding your like my limits or like, you know, what I can maybe do physically or a mental challenge or like just these something new because the, like I love bike racing, but it, it, there is, there's a degree of monotony to it. Um, and so it, it, it's like, it's cool because you have both ends of the spectrum that I, that I, I enjoy both ends. I, I really enjoy, um, I love training for races and getting prepared for them like that. It's very specific targeted training. Um, you know, all the like staring at my power meter and looking at all the numbers. I also, as I've gotten older, have love the very other end of that spectrum. Like I have a Garmin a lot, like when I do these trips, mostly because I don't want to get lost. Um, but uh you know it's just there kind of tracking where we go and like it has my routes in it but i am completely removed from that like training metrics world um the most recent trip we did up island was just places like I've, you know i'd never been north of courtney and um you know we were up there and even amongst it all like it was a pretty filthy trip it rained three or four days um it was like nine degrees as a high some days I had food poisoning. Um, it was just terrible. <laughs> and it was still like one of the coolest trips I've done. Um, and, you know, I've got a list of other places I want to go, even like with NBC. We went out to Chilcotin the weekend afterwards and did, um, you know, 
three or four days and now I'm biking up there and all I could think about was like I'd already and I'd pre-planned this trip before to go from like Bella Coola through the Chilcote and back through Pemberton and into Squamish with my friend and yeah the world's a big place and yeah seeing about bike is about as good as it gets in my opinion so um yeah it's just tough now balancing that with a professional bike racing career well I think what's what's pretty neat is that you're sort of setting yourself up for a post-professional uh, still riding career in a way. Like, I think there's a real, uh, I think people love following stuff that's a little bit outside of the box. When I think of you, I think of a guy who was doing, uh, you know, gravel riding before gravel riding is actually a thing now. <laughs> you know, like I, now it's like this big popular thing. I'm like, you know, there's actually been one guy who's like sort of been doing this for a very long time. <laughs> I, 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 I just call it riding. You just call it riding. That's right. Now it's a whole thing unto itself. Um, what about the, uh, I think a few years ago, did, did, was it Japan that you did a massive trip? Uh, just last fall, actually. Yeah, time flies with the COVID. <laughs> What's that? Um, uh, so it was just last fall. Yeah, it was less than a oh, year ago. Oh, gosh, but okay. Time, time, fl time flies with this whole thing. Yeah. Um, no, so yeah, it was um, the initial trip I did was in 2018 we did um calgary to um port ramp trip over 10 days or nine, nine days and um last year um japan was the target so we flew there on the 31st of october and basically hit the ground running like uh yeah just threw in some international jet lag to the whole equation of something that's already like pretty a pretty massive undertaking um but we landed in tokyo on not whatever the first like landed on in tokyo in the evening on day one we'll call it um you know bikes through trains walking on streets to tokyo get to our hotel um like walk around that night kind of get set up get camp fuel and things for the trip and then the next morning at like, you know, 6 a.m. or 5 a.m., you know, you're up building your bike, getting your bags on it, getting all that stuff packed, figuring out what, what stays at the hotel, what's going to come with you. Um, and most of it, you know, you have it already sorted. Um, and then, yeah, so as you can imagine, there's delay over delay, like just getting our shit in order. And uh, then eventually we caught the train that we were wanted to catch um just you know tons of stories to go on with all of this but um short story long is we got delayed we didn't quite make it originally we wanted to make it into the heart of hiroshima and then work our way back up but they're just with the way the day had been delayed um there was kind of like these certain like checkpoints we had to make and if we didn't make one of them it meant we missed the ferry which meant it kind of like backslogged the next day which was already going to be 270 kilometers with like five or six thousand meters of climbing on like day two um so to add like another 60k plus a ferry ride it's it just like the time and distance because the day after that we had another ferry we had to catch so like the first three days were pretty crucial that they went off without a hitch so we actually had to like i was on the train on day one on my phone on komoot which is like a, another like a different navigation app similar to Strava creating a new route from where the train was going to we had to now get off take a different train to a different spot in the Hiroshima region and then get off there to a route I had to plan on the train over like sitting on the floor because there's nowhere for us to sit and then drop into my Garmin to like get to like basically the place we'd planned to camp in the first place that night so that the next two days went off that hitch because they were like the second day was so massive and the day after that we had to catch the first ferry otherwise we were going to be going through kyoto and um osaka or sorry, um osaka and uh sorry i can't the name of case but it's the other two like um major cities in um in japan like tokyo up north hiroshima in the south Osaka and the other one, which is the yeah, escape me anyway. So we basically started in you know, Hiroshima, did like this amazing ride through the islands, which actually turned out to be like one of the most popular cycling routes in all of Japan. 
it was beautiful. It's like the connection of seven islands over these bridges. It was the best possible way we could have started. And then looped back up and it was, I think like 1400 K in eight days, kind of the culminating with like the, the last night, um, camping on the shoulder of Mount Fuji and then riding back into, uh, Tokyo on the final day on the Olympics road race course, which had to happen this year. I was like shortlisted for. So it was, the trip had a lot of like different kind of highlights and meanings, but that was, yeah, there's, you know, you do an entire one of these shows just on like that trip alone or just on the like, Calgary trip alone. There's so many stories that come from these. Every day has, you know, its own challenges and it's different stuff. That I just love it, man. Like good for you. You know, a lot of people, including myself, when I race, we got, we got kind of stuck in our little box of like, this is the way you're supposed to train. And, um, and and prepare for something but i i feel like you just kind of there's as you said a, a big part of you that needs and loves adventure and it's the thankfully you love being on your bike enough that it's almost like your hobby is also being on a bike you know you're a pro cyclist but the thing you also love to do is just hang out on your bike for 1400 k over eight days i mean that's like pretty rare you know if when i was racing when i was like outside of you know, critical training. Like I needed to do other things. I, I didn't really want to go hang out on my bike for another eight hours. So I love that. It's a really cool. Uh, it's it's hundred percent true. And it's now I kind of realized like, um, a couple of years ago, I would have said it's like being a pro road racer is what affords me the time to be an amateur mountain biker. Cause it's like, I was just getting back into like mountain biking again. I loved it so much. And it's like, yeah, being able to race professionally on the road gave me all this time in the off season to just mountain bike and I bought my new mountain bike each fall and like go rip around on that bike two months. And now it's like I just realized like cycling is very much like in the D in my like DNA and like I love riding my bike. Even like to where it's like racing aside, like I haven't felt like that deep missing like I miss racing right now. It's like when I hurt my knee, um during COVID and couldn't get it fixed. Um, that's when I realized just how much like I needed to like ride my bike. It wasn't like, Oh, whatever. I was like, gosh, I needed, like it was a need to ride because I don't have a lot of other like background sports or things like this to like kind of, um, get that outlet of energy is just biking. So, you know, yeah, a bit all the time, but that's okay. Yeah. How much, like, do you, uh, do you feel like those big long adventures actually help prepare you? Like, I know, like, you know, when I think of pro cycling or pro anything, I think of very specific pre preparation and very specific wattage. If you're getting ready for a time trial, you better be dialing that in. If you're getting ready for a hilly stage or crits or whatever, like you have to train pretty specifically for that. But it sounds like, like some of these big ride adventures where the pace is probably fairly organic. You're not sticking to a certain wattage. You're just trying to make a, an end point each day. It actually sounds like that really helps drive your fitness. Am I right on that or? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I think I discovered like years ago that, um, I respond very, very well to volume. Um, and I think part of that does come with, with age. I like could maybe it, a bit, but even still, like when I was younger, um, intensity wasn't necessarily uh, the biggest factor. Like, obviously, I need that as well, but my intensity always will come with like relatively significant volume block. Mm -hmm. um, and this has just like confirmed that almost to like in three, like, um, it just like, like I did the bike packing. It was this huge, like, well, let's just see what happens. When I did the first one um, from Calgary to, uh, like, the island, because I had never really done one before. Um, I'd never done, like, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back days like this. And I remember very clearly um, talking with, like, the director of uh, High Performance for Cycling Canada. It was like for Worlds that year, and I'd been selected. Um, it was, would have been, it was going to be my first road race worlds. 
uh, and we had like Mike Woods who was targeting the race to like metal. Um, a very demanding course. It was like the hardest world they'd come up with in decades. They're calling it Austria. Uh, like 4,800 meters of climbing, 270K, like just this epic, epic race. And I remember talking to Kevin Field about it and saying like, okay, well, this is what I like. Cause I'd already planned this trip with my friends and it was important to me to do it um, for a lot of reasons, but um, Usually, I say I'm going to do it and to go back. And then, like, I don't have the best relationship maybe with Cycling Canada at the time. So, like, well, whatever, screw world, I don't need to do that. Then I kind of, I'm like, well, no. And I, kept, I guess it's back and forth in my head. And then eventually, um, I told Kevin, like, hey, I'm going to do this bike packing trip. And this is why I think it's going to work. And if you don't think it's going to work, then I get it. I understand, but I'm going to do this. So, yeah, he responded. He was like fully on board. Um, he said, I think that's a great idea. I think, yeah, yeah that's going to, like, the way I sold it, he was, like, didn't think it was a bad idea. Um, but it was definitely, like, people asked me uh, before the start, like, so you did what before? Like, you know, these guys coming from, like, doing the wealth, uh, doing, like, you know, a bunch of, like, hard, like, Euro, like, stage races or one-day races, like, the World Tour guys, the good guys. Yeah, there's, there's only four of us on the team, so the Woods. And then um, Hugo Hul and Antoine Duchesne, the other two like world tour racers. And then Rob, the guy who just rigged bike packed across Western Canada. <laughs> and they're like, they're like, could not wrap their head around it. And asking, like, you think you're going to be okay for this race? Like, you think it's going to work? I'm like, and I, I stuck to my guns, but you have to like, think like on the inside, like shit. I mean, ask me again, like 36 hours after the race is over. And it was like one of the best days of racing I've had in my life. I made the break, was out front for 240 of the 270K. Um, and then Woods went on to get third, which really had nothing to do with me. But um, I did finish the race, which is more than the other two guys. And I, I, I was laughing, like, Mike was on the podium getting his medal. And I finished, like, dead last, I think, like, maybe 25 minutes down or something, or 30 minutes down. Um, and the final climb was just this heinous, 2k i think averaged 18 percent or 20 percent um so at the end of seven and a half hours it was like grunting up this thing and somebody's walking beside me and told me that was that like gotten third which was a super super cool um uh experience to have that happen and uh yeah all that off of, like, i mean I'd, I'd done a whole season of training up to this point but you know, the specific lead in was bike packing, and there's nobody who'd done that before, like a one day bike race. So, yeah. yeah, I feel like it's one of those things where if if you really fail, then everybody's like, ha ha, told you. But if you don't, yeah. then they're like, oh, that was a genius move. Like, <laughs> that's exactly what it was. And it was, yeah. it, I was, I was that like guinea pig for my own like experiment. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so last year I was like, well, might as well do it before the season starts off, kind of like kickstart that. Because we'd had a pretty, uh, Rick and I had a pretty relaxed off season. We went to Italy and just like, we got what getting was good pre COVID, both yeah. sites. And then, um, you know, eight pizza pretty much for at least some meal every day and ice cream and all the good stuff that comes along with being on vacation in Italy. Um, so I was, uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit heavy, but, um, you know, came back and then went straight into this uh, bike packing trip, um, and it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Do you see me for just one second? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. I'll be right back. Yeah. Bread in the oven. Hey, uh, anybody else on on here? If you have any questions, let me know. Michelle, I I saw your comment there. I'll share it with them uh, when he gets back. Um, just so I think you're referring to following his trip on. Uh, the one he did in Japan, maybe? Yeah, it was so, it was super awesome. I didn't want to like interrupt the flow of the story, but I remember watching that, like following on Instagram and just being like, whoa, yeah. swimming, Master Swimming Worlds was supposed to be in Japan in 2021 and now it's in 2022. Okay. And so my, my overall plan is to take like 
a, either six months or a year sabbatical and do master's worlds again and then just ride throughout japan and then i'm also a scuba diver so i was gonna like dive as well but that's like that totally his trip totally robert's trip totally inspired me to go to japan and just spend a lot of time there and take a bike <laughs> oh for sure i uh, like um i couldn't recommend the country enough it's it's freaking amazing. Um, and especially like if you're going to take time there, uh, do it when it's warm enough to get up to, um, Hokkaido, the North Island. Um, it, that's a place I would have really liked to have gotten to. Um, but it was just, we went in November. So it was, it was cold. Yeah. Like it, it would have been too cold up there. Even when we, it's wild. The temperature swings in that Island are not like, um, from Hiroshima, to uh oh kyoto that was the other time um so uh from here you know, up to like the like shoulder of mount fuji was like a 20 degree celsius swing like we were like sleep like the first night we were just like sleeping like basically in like the lightest thing we had like on top of our sleeping bags and by the last night we like I mean, I remember one night we had everything on, like everything in our, in our bags, like two spiked down jackets, everything I had, gloves curled up and like, you just come in and out of sleep because you're so cold. And that was over nine days. And like, we're not talking mass about, like we were a bit higher, but, and you know, this is only halfway up the island when you go to like Hokkaido. But if you're there in like the warm months, like the exception of like rain, which is, it is what it is if you're from the island to get it but or like um yeah it's it's such an amazing amazing country and like the nicest people you'll ever meet like in the world like kind of like the kindness and friendliness that makes like canadians seem rude yeah sweet <laughs> so, japan's yeah. been on my list for a while and like i just really want to i think it's a country that will take a lot of time so i'm willing to spend like several months there to just see as much as I can and really try to get as much culture and food and yeah <laughs> geography as possible so yes this is cool. um it's, def it's definitely worth your it's in my opinion for being there for a very short amount of time it's definitely worth the time to experience it because there is so much like you have and, and they've done such a good job of protecting their culture as well um mm. you have you know the big cities obviously like um tokyo like it's you know this city of the future almost um but then you also have these small little fishing villages like everywhere else and you don't have to go that far out of um the big cities to see it's just like it's still so quiet and um just old really so yeah it's it, it's a really unique place and like we barely scratched the surface it was everything like you know, we saw we like we traveled a lot of distance, but you still um, you can still only experience so much when you kind of have to give it point to point. So, yeah, yeah, you'll love it. Definitely worth it. Cool, thanks. Of course, uh, that's really cool. So, Michelle, you were saying that the it, it, it's twenty twenty two World Masters swimming. Yeah, like has it been moved a year, or was that always? It got it got moved a year, so it was because it's every two years. So it's 2017 in Budapest, 2019 Korea, 2021 was in, it's in Fukuoka in the South. And so they've moved it a year. So now it's June, 2022. Okay. I think so. you should uh, sort of steal a page from Rob's book and do swim packing. It's like swim <laughs> for like That is a thing. A That's a thing? <laughs> it's a thing. No, yes. it's not a thing. Yes, it is a thing. <laughs> Get out, really? So they call them swim treks and they're like, it's like fully supported, but you swim, there's some in Mallorca and in like the Greek islands and in the Caribbean where like there's a boat that carries your stuff, but you swim between the islands. No way. Yeah. <laughs> swim trekking. That's actually really wow. funny. I was, I was yeah. totally just being. No, no, it's the thing. I don't think that like some of the swims are probably like 8K in a day, but you're doing like 2K and then 8K and then 5K and then 3K and you like go between wow. all the islands or whatever. And then like the boat carries your stuff and you just, it's like a fully supported bike touring thing, except for swimming. That's actually really <laughs> funny. I feel like, I don't know if you're joking. 
it's first I will send you a link. <laughs> uh, well, I have friends who've done it. It seems really cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, okay, Rob, I one mm. other one other little rabbit hole I wanted to go down with you. Um, and again, if anybody else on here has a question, I'm sort of dominating the airspace, but um I yeah, if you have a question, jump in there. But I, I kind of want to get to this part of your cycling journey where it seemed like it was kind of falling apart. And I remember a time where you were like really ready to pack it in. And I can't, I can't quite remember what year it was. I remember you getting a, a contract to go race in England. And I remember talking to you after and it just like, it was sort of a pretty miserable year. And I think you came back and you're like, what am I doing? And so there was this time, I feel like, where you're at a crossroads and you were going to pack it in and you didn't and look at all the great things that have happened. But it, can you remember that time and sort of like, what, what was it that kept you going? That's the first question. The second question is, I feel like you went from, as we said earlier, you weren't this prodigy rider, but now you've come, you know, when we're a decade later, I mean, you're, one of the best Canadian cyclists that we have right now. Was there anything in particular with your training, with your preparation, with your mindset that really got you there? Or was it just a, like, like I'm going to outlast everybody kind of game. Can you point to any one thing or. I don't know. If, I mean, I'm definitely more stubborn than just about anybody I know. Um, and I mean, Tony, um, joke about this but it's there's it's only a half joke i definitely had this list uh, of people in my head that had like done something on the way and like you know thought they were better than me or like i hate i hated people just thinking i wasn't good enough and and a lot of times it was pretty reasonable thought i wasn't good enough um but i always thought that maybe i was better than i was and I kept getting a little bit better each year and and working away, um, you know, kind of against the odds to get on to Bissell, um, which was one of the, like, one of the best um, American pro teams at the time. And so I was on that team for a couple of years, which is already kind of like pretty unprecedented for a kid from Saskatchewan, um, you know, never had raced on like the, one of the, the big BC teams here, um, to get onto a pro team kind of on his own. Um, and then I didn't get renewed one year. Um, kind of, this is a long story behind that. But anyway, I didn't get renewed and ended up racing, having to go back and race as an amateur um, on H&R Block for a year. I had some okay results there, uh, but it, it is tough to be an amateur um racing against pros even though i had experience up there it's uh there's a big difference um so it was yeah when you say it's close it was like i had already had an interview um with ben who still works as a, the head mechanic at mount Cummins co-op they just at the time they just sort of started their uh, bike department i think they only had it for a year or two and i had had an interview with him to um yeah be basically a bike mechanic at Mount Escombe Co-op. And um, I think I was doing so, some stuff just for supplementary income uh, with B78, doing some coaching, because I really didn't know. I, you know, I talked to um, Arthur Anderson uh, when I came back from the UK, or even during the, like, partway through this uh, UK trip. So I got a contract um, with Rally, like, not Rally I race for now, but, um, like, Rally Bikes in the UK, um, kind of in the 11th hour. Like, I'd gotten a call from them and a day later I got a call from Mech saying like I had gotten the job and you know sitting there I'm like oh, I gotta take I have to race like it, yeah it's in Europe but it everything kind of happens for a reason and so I'm like okay I'm given this opportunity to keep racing on bikes what I wanted to do um it's the only thing I've ever been any good at at all really um so and like good is using the term loosely uh and so I took the contract rally. Um, it was 
it was a great year for cycling. I got to see lots of places. The UK, um, I'd go back and ride in a heartbeat. Like, you know, I got to experience America. Um, but it was probably the worst year of racing I'd ever done. It was, it was just a pretty dreadful experience as a bike racer. Um, yeah, definitely flirted with like, not quite alcoholism, but like it became like a pretty like solid part of my day. I'd go and do these like five or six hour rides in the UK just to fill the day. Cause I only raced like, I think on the team I raced like 10 days in the whole season. Um, so I was over there from January to September. And I came home for, I think three weeks in June, which was amazing. Um, I actually did more taste of racing that year with the uh, Canadian national team. I did both. Um, and then the Quebec World Tour races and Tour Alberta that year. So between those races, I did more races with the national team than with the UK team, which I was there for the whole year. Um, so it was all in all a pretty dreadful experience. And I remember part way through that year talking with a guy about like maybe being an electrician. I like I'm good for my hands. I, I've done construction in the past, like, you know, trying to make cycling work. And yeah, that was another year. So two years in a row. So um, 2012 and 2013 um, were both years so close to just packing it in and calling it a day. Um, I don't know what there was one specific thing that kept me from stopping, but um, I think full time it was just in the 11th hour. Uh, and then it, it was true Alberta. I, I met with Mike Creed. Um, on, and he, I'd say that I met with him. And then later on that fall, I started to work with Chris Baldwin. And those two guys I'll always like attribute, like kind of the turning point in my career. Creed um, saw something in me that like I didn't see and like helped me develop into the rider, like the like GC stage race rider, like that I am now. Like, he saw that kind of there I never had like would have had confidence in no other director had ever like given confidence in me and Mike kind of like created um like this leader persona through like I like definitely am a lead through action kind of guy and so everything kind of changed from like that point on um and it changed very fast over like 20 like from the fall 2013 to fall 2014 I was like a different rider but yeah there, I don't know if there's any specific thing other than like just that general grit and willingness to work harder than like anybody else. I, I don't, yeah, just the idea of just giving up didn't really cross my mind, but at the same time you have to be like, I think about like young riders now, how do I tell them like, Oh yeah, just keep going, keep going. You know, I was shit, man, I was 28 and getting offered a contract for like 17 grand like that's like <laughs> you know i think that's two thousand dollars above what we consider like poverty in canada for a year i think it might even be less now i get uh, you know negotiating to try to get a bike out of the, that deal um like that's you know not not a lot of like i certainly wasn't doing it for the financial benefit like i could literally have walked away and gone and worked and flip burgers at McDonald's and made, you know, 30 grand a year. So, um, yeah, it was an interesting time those two years, but obviously now, like, I'm glad I stuck with it. And there's, and even like through my successful years, I've had plenty of little setbacks and this and that, um, along the way. But, um, yeah, I'm at the point now where, uh, after Utah, um, like, I, like obviously like if, as an athlete, you never want to stop before your potential, like reaching maybe with a potential that you see in yourself or the like theoretical potential. Um, and some people will never discover that. And some people, um, you know, it, they just, their potential is, is lower than what maybe they thought it was. And I think I'm definitely in that category. Winning Tour of Utah changed everything for me. Like it, it erased any preconceived notions of what I thought was I was capable of. So, and, and even to this point, like I, I, for this day, like, I don't know, like, okay, what is my potential now? Like that was such a kind of unbelievable thing. Like five years prior, like 
it just rewrote the whole script. Now it's like, okay, well, I'll just take whatever comes to me. Like I'll prepare for these races, but like I've already achieved so much more in my career than I ever would have thought like possible from like those rides doing pack sport and like, you know, the rain in like January in 2003, when we were like, when I first came out here, like this, that kid never, ever had a chance of, you know, winning Tour of Utah or like winning Canadian like time trial championships. This is like or racing tour of Switzerland and riding like front group over like some of these climbs. Like this is these are not like these should not have been like in the same reality for one person. So yeah, I don't know if there's a single thing, but that's uh kind of the story with what those two years were like and yeah. Yeah. That's cool, man. I, but in a way, like, it sounds like tour of Utah, like that was a, a big, big moment for you. W- was it, it, it sounds like you were uh, in a way a little bit surprised, but was it also kind of a relief that all that sort of decisions you'd made to stick with it were like, ah, oh, okay. Massively. It, it was worth it. Yeah. That was probably, um, when people ask me that, what, like, oh, what was it like to win? It's like, it, that's one of the, like, words that does come to mind. It's like, it, it was this relief that finally I, because, like, at a certain point, all of that stuff, the, like, these little results, the thirds, the seconds, the fourths, like, they all are just sitting there. And it's like, somebody who gets that many almost wins, like, you just need to win for yourself. Otherwise, you're just an almost guy. You never really did it. Um so it was this huge relief and weight off my shoulders um, when I crossed the line. Like, not just like the acute, like, okay, we won the race. It was like this, like, career long, like, ah, I finally have, like, I have a thing. I did, like, this is my big thing that I did. Um, and that was massive. Like, okay. And I, there's lots of little things I can look back on, like, very proudly, but it's like, that's the one that was, like, the exhale. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, I love how honest you are about that because I, I think there's probably a, a fair number of people who feel like that where they're like, oh, I finally have something. I finally have like a thing that will, no one can ever take away. And it sort of just, it justifies all of the crap I had to go through. <laughs> oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people who like thought I should have stopped a long time ago or yeah. like questioned like why I kept on going. Yeah. And, and now you have a thing. This is why. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, you know, I just in the interest of time, I think that's actually a really good place to, to call it. That's we've yep. had an hour. I do. That's so great. I, uh, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for coming on and sharing that you're, you seem actually like a really, uh, pretty thoughtful about the whole journey you've been on. Like you, you almost seem like a bit of a philosopher. I, I it's kind of neat to hear how sort of calmly you talk about the whole journey. It's it's refreshing. Yeah, I mean, it's I've had I've had time to think about it, um, but um, yeah, it's it's just I think it's because I never really had that. Uh, protege like oh this this kid's special um yeah youth it was always like you know a bit of an uphill battle um and just like those little like i always tell people it's like you know you can get 10 percent better it's just where you get that 10 percent and I, I mine was um just over the course of like 20 years i got you know one to two percent better every year and then like at a certain point it was like three to five percent better and three to five percent improvement at you know when i was younger was you know like not even noticeable (laughs) so bad um and but three to five but that consistency kept happening each year three to five three to five three to five three to five and then like when you're getting three to five percent better like when you're already kind of good now in north america that's all of a sudden like it's not all of a sudden it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Rob's just a little bit better. Oh, we got to watch out for this guy now. And then it's like, you start to believe in yourself and then it's, mm-hmm. everything just snowballs like crazy. So yeah, it's 
the path has been very slow, so it makes it easy to tell the story because I've had a long time to write it. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, by, by the sounds of it, you know, just your passion and love for cycling in general, I don't, I don't quite think it's over. You know, even even when maybe professional racing is is a thing of the past for you, I just have a feeling you're going to light up the uh, the adventure world and as i said at the beginning i think it, for anybody watching who if you don't follow rob on strava or instagram you should because it's just interesting you know like some of the stuff you do is just cool you know it's kind of out of the box a little bit it's kind of kind of crazy and epic and but also with a really amazing sense of adventure so uh, i think it's it's very cool anyway i i thank you so much man like thanks for my for, pleasure taking some time this morning and uh i think i messed up uh the the link a little bit but people will see it on on youtube later michelle's giving you a big thank you she also gave us uh, a link to this swim trek company if anybody's interested <laughs> let me know and i can show you how to do some swim packing or where to go <laughs> oh yeah nice sounds um, good yeah anyway thank you rob and uh look forward to uh riding some mountain bikes with you again soon yeah for sure man that's <laughs> it. okay buddy all right thanks everybody okay, okay. cheers see ya, see ya.